Good afternoon. I am a Dr. Elise Jordan, head of reference at Lamar University and a member of the Arizona Library Association's Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The Arizona Library Association's Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase their knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen if you are attending on a desktop computer or at the top of your screen if you are attending from a mobile device. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association's YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Patricia Hernandez will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the telephone number and access code provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we, will, we ask that you complete a simple four question evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. The Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the native, na native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations whose ancestral homelands and resources Arizona Library Association members libraries were built. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Arizona Library Association members accountable to the information needs of American Indians and indigenous people. I would like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit our website for additional information. Amazon will donate 0.5% of your eligible purchases made through smilearizona.com, excuse me, smileamazon.com to the Arizona Library Association when you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Arizona, Amazon Smile portal. The Professional Development Committee wants you if you have expertise in library science that you think you would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You can also find a link in your professional development monthly newsletter. I would also like to announce the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by AZLA Professional Development Committee. On August 12, 2021, Join us for Library Con Online, connecting community and popular culture on virtual stage. Even as lockdowns were lifted, virtual programs became an essential avenue for community engagement. So Jolene Bradley, Glenn Brown, Shelley Reddy, and Andrea Small and others from Maricopa County Library District brought their Library Con back to life in a new way. This type of event, which is family friendly and appeals to a wide demographic in the community as a perfect complement to plan efforts for National Library Card Sign Up Month. And virtual programming provided new opportunities, allowing individuals to access content during a two week time period while coming back for special events and activities. Staff identified previously recorded programs that could be seen as an encore design new programs and engage with creators in the community. Jolene Bradley, Glenn Brown, Shelley Reddy, and Andrea Small 
are professionals with a combined 41 years of experience in libraries and have attended more than 25 cons and many more festivals and con style events. Their hobbies include blacksmithing, cosplay, both construction and wearing, drawing, reading, tabletop gaming, video games, and writings. They will discuss the events, strategies for success, and lessons learned from their virtual library con. Registration for webinars is posted to the Arizona State Library's event calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development newsletter, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank you for attending today. Now I'll pass the presenter's privileges to Lauren Clemento for her presentation, How to Build a Virtual Escape Room. Thank you, Elise, and thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Lauren Clementino, and I am the Training and Volunteer Services Librarian and currently the Interim Reference Supervisor for the Flagstaff City Coconino County Public Library. So before we get started, a little bit about me and my journey to virtual escape rooms. When, let's see, back in the pre-COVID times, um, in 2019, I worked with a team of my coworkers to plan a series of in-person escape room events. And then like many of you on this webinar, I'm sure, I suddenly found myself working from home in March, 2020 and quickly trying to adapt to a, a virtual programming world and come up with virtual content for our patrons. And I wanted to build on the success and the excitement that we had around our in-person escape rooms. We had been planning to do more um, in person in 2020. And so I kind of wanted to capitalize on that um, and come up with a way to do things virtually. I was also looking um, for ways to build virtual programs that were a little more non-traditional than your standard uh, Zoom program. Um, and that also could tie into some of our other programming and also be adaptable to uh, work with the Summer Reading Challenge, which I'm sure many of you participate in. So when all this happened in March 2020, I started looking into different ways to build a virtual escape room and started doing some research and experimentation. Um, and then I discovered that for me, it seemed like using Google Forms to build an escape room was gonna be the best route. And I built two escape, virtual escape rooms in early first half of 2020. Um, and so I'll go into a little bit about both of those as we go through this presentation. Um, but the first one I, I built based on an in-person escape room that we had done with a Harry Potter theme. It was an OWL exam escape room. And the second one, which I will demo in a little bit, um, I built from scratch, and that one um, was, is a Free the Library Scrolls themed escape room. And I learned so much along the way about how to do all of this, and that's why I developed this presentation, was just to share with everyone who might be considering doing this, you know, what I learned and some tips and best practices, so you don't have to figure it all out from scratch by yourself. So... That was my story and how I got to virtual escape rooms, but why should you be interested in virtual escape rooms? So some of the great things that I've learned about them, first of all, they're free. Um, and of course, like most things, you know, you could pay for resources if you wanted to, but you can also build this completely from free for free. And they're available anytime, anywhere, both for staff working on them and building them. You know, you can do it from home and then also for all of your patrons and customers, students, you know, they can access this anytime, anywhere. And again, I, the success of in-person escape rooms in, pre, in the past few years, you know, they've been so popular. And so this is a way to, you know, build on the success of that and the excitement for those. And one really great thing about the virtual escape rooms is that they can reach a lot more people than the in-person ones. If any of you have hosted an in-person escape room 
before, you know that, you know, part of the experience is that it's, it's a limited group size. Um, and so in order to, you know, facilitate that um, on, it's hard to do it on a really big scale and reach a lot of people. Um, so one great thing about converting to a virtual format is it's, you know, endless, you can, you can reach everyone. Another couple other great things that I found about this is um, the first one that I did where I reused a lot of our existing material that we had already created. You know, we just got a lot more mileage out of all of the work that we'd already done with that in-person program and the props and all the materials that we created. And so that was really rewarding, um, you know, to all that work we put into it to come up with additional things to keep that going and reach more people with its, the same things. And it's also really adaptable across library types and age groups. I work in adult reference, so what I've worked on, I've designed for adults, but you can easily adapt it to different skill levels and different library types and group types. So now I'm going to pop out of the slideshow and actually go in and do a little preview of one of the virtual escape rooms that I created just so you can kind of get an idea of what one actually looks like um, before we go any further into talking about how to build one. So this is one of the finished products. This is the Free the Library Squirrels escape room that I created last year while we were closed. Um, and so this, again, I created this in Google Forms and this is actually what the participant view, what you would look like, what it would look like if you went in right now to take it yourself. And so this first home page here, you can see I designed a header that's at the top and that carries across all the pages. And I've got the title and a little welcome message. One optional thing that you don't need to do, but I decided to do for my escape rooms was to build in a custom finisher certificate that will get emailed to patrons who complete the escape room. So on this first page, I'm collecting email addresses and names. I've gone and filled mine out. And then I just added some little graphics to kind of get you started, um, set the scene for the escape room. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit next to get to the next section. Um, and now this next section is a little bit of the introduction. And you could have had this as your first page if you didn't want to do collect email addresses and names, or I could have just made it a really long first page. But so a little bit about this escape room, the introduction, please read the note below to get started. Hint the lib open the library's website in a new browser tab and use the catalog to search for books and navigate through the library. And there's a link to our catalog. And then I created this graphic here, um, which is a little more exciting than just typing all of the words into Google Forms just to have a little more visual interest. And the premise here is when the Flagstaff Public Library closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, five squirrels were trapped inside the building. The squirrels enjoy different genres and have scattered throughout the library. Luckily, the squirrels left clues behind that you can use to locate them. Once you have rounded up the squirrels and clues, you will have everything you need to help them escape from the library. A book appears to have been left behind by the squirrels as your first clue. So I'm gonna hit next and go to the next screen. And so this is gonna be our first puzzle. And so clue number one, this book appears to have been left behind by the squirrels. Take a closer look at the book and any clues it contains. Do the clues lead to a certain book and section of the library? And as you can kind of guess, the, one of the goals of this escape room was to get to know how to use the catalog and get to know a little bit more about our library, especially while we were closed and you're at home. So first we've got a picture of a book. And then the second picture is a close up of all of the clues that were left behind. So, um, and if you can probably guess what the book is, since this is a group of librarians, and if you wanna go ahead and throw that in the chat, that would be great. But so the clues, there's a book that says playing with fire there is a box of matches and there is a bookmark that says, with a book on top that says it was a pleasure to burn. And there is a two of clubs playing card. 
So looking at these, you might already have a guess in mind of what book this might be, or you could use Google to kind of search around and come up with an idea. And so the first question here is based on these clues, what book title should you look for? And please type answer in uppercase. So I'm gonna purposely put in a wrong answer because then it's going to give us a hint and say, try again, hint, it was a pleasure to burn is the first line of this book. So if you didn't, if that, the picture isn't enough of a clue, here's another clue. So if you wanted, you could go Google, it was a pleasure to burn and it would give you, um, you would pretty quickly figure out that this book is Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. I'm gonna go ahead and type that in here. And now our red warning text went away because we got the right answer so we can proceed. And now the next question is where in the library should you look for this book? And this of course would be a great time to go to the catalog um, and figure out where it's located. But we're just gonna go ahead and guess fiction and hit next. And oops, we got a try again message. This book was located in a different section. Go back and try again. And then here's another hint to remind us that we, if we could use the catalog to find out this answer. So let's go back. And as I'm sure most of you know, this is actually should be in science fiction. So I hit science fiction and next. And it's taking a minute to progress the next screen, but here we go. Congratulations. We found the science fiction squirrel. So now, you know, going back to the beginning, the instructions, we had to find five squirrels. So now we found one. Um, you may have noticed that we also picked up another clue along the way that two of club's card wasn't directly related to um, the book. So let's keep, you know, you can keep that on your back pocket and know that that's probably going to come into play later on in the escape room. And so we don't have time to go through the whole escape room right now and get find all the squirrels and help them get out of the library. But I just wanted to do a quick overview so you could see the finished product a little bit about what it looks like, what it can do, the types of things that you can add, the types of questions that you can ask and build. So now we're, I'm gonna switch back to the presentation. So going back um, to how to start planning. So now you've kind of got an idea in mind of what this could look like, um, but how to actually go about planning one of these. So first step is to establish the escape room theme and goal. And the one that I had decided with my example was the goal was going to be to get these squirrels out of the library, help them escape. Um, and of course, the theme was the library itself, and then also just general the pandemic that the libraries closed, and they were all trapped in here. Um, and of course, with a virtual escape room, you're not physically trapped in a space, but you could still pretend that you are and you could build your theme around that. Um, and I've seen in a lot of other escape room examples, the goal is actually to help a character escape. So you could help Katniss escape from the Hunger Games or something like that. And I've also seen a lot of them, they're sort of non-traditional, it's less escaping and more going on a quest. So a lot of them are quests to find a person, character, place, or objects. Um, and then once you've got this theme and goal in mind, then from there I started creating the story and the progression of how this is going to work. So, um, so with my story, I knew, okay, so I'm going to have these squirrels trapped in the library. Um, I'm going to keep it to five. That's a manageable number. Um, and the story is that they're each going to be in a different genre and different part of the library. So you're going to have to find them throughout the library. And then once you've rounded them all up, there's going to be a final thing that you need to do to actually unlock the front doors and get them outside. And now that I once kind of had this overall idea of how it was going to work, I sat down to do the nuts and bolts of like, okay, these are going to be the tasks and puzzles to actually advance the story. And here's what you're going to have to find. And then developing the clues and the questions. And one big thing to keep in mind with escape room planning is unlike most in-person escape rooms that have set time limits, 
virtual escape rooms um, using Google Forms do not. I have seen in some other examples that um, in the instructions in the beginning, they suggest that there is a time limit and that you keep a timer on for yourself um, and try and pace yourself, but um, you don't have to do that. I chose not to do that to make it a little bit easier. Um, and I didn't think it was needed in the ones that I was making, but that is an option. And then if you were gonna do that, you'd just wanna build that into your plan somehow. So now I'm going to jump out of my presentation again um, and go back to Google Forms and show you the back end of what it looks like. And there's so much to share here and so much to think about that I'm. it's not possible to go through all of the ins and outs, but um, as Patty just threw in the chat, that I did create a handout and it has a lot of screenshots and um, detailed instructions on step-by-step -step how to build this. So if I, um, so you don't have to take copious notes right now. There's everything should be in the handout and, and more than what I can cover right now. But I thought it'd be good just to kind of see somebody else do it, walk you through it, and then you can kind of compare the finished product. Now you can see the back end of how it was built. So first things first, if you log into a Google account and then open um, Google Forms and open a new blank form. This is the first page that you will see. This is what they Google defaults to. So you can go ahead and in this top box here, you can type in, um, oops, still have it on caps lock in the escape room. <laughs> Your title uh, and then in description, you can add that welcome message or introduction. And what the title you put here is gonna show on every page of your escape room. Um, the welcome message in the description box, that's just gonna show on your first page. And so you also here might wanna do some customization of the theme from the, the kind of default purple background with no header. And you can click on the paint palette in the upper corner here. And that is going to pull up um, the, this theme options box. And so the first thing that you can do is click choose image under header and you can choose your header. And this is gonna show up on every page, just like the title. So Google has a ton that you can choose from in here, but I'm gonna go ahead and upload the one that I just used for the squirrel escape room. Okay, so here it is and in the handout, there are instructions on if you want to create your own, the specific size that you need to use to create this. So I'm going to hit done. And then you'll notice once the header is uploaded, the theme color over here in the background color sort of auto adjust to match the colors in your header. So all of the, the whole design will go together. So I can choose, okay, well, I like this color better. And then let's do this for the background color. And I can go down to the bottom here and change my font style to um, any of these other styles if I want to. And again, this shows up across every page. But let's just leave it with the basic one. And um, this gear up here is the settings if you wanted to go ahead um, and adjust the settings. So you can do things like collect email addresses, which I had turned on. And under presentation, you can add a confirmation, confirmation message. And this is what will display on the very final page after people have completed the escape room, hit submit, this is their final message. So here you can put a little thank you from your library or some additional links or things like that. So let's get started with the nuts and bolts of how to actually add all these different pages. So. Um, this bar here on the right hand side is where you're going to do most of that and click here first the bottom one is to add a new section. Each section is basically a page so at, when I was doing the example before every time I hit next I was switching between sections. So I'm going to add a section here and let's say with my welcome page maybe I wanted to add a photo to go with that so um, or maybe a video. Those buttons are also right here on the right side. 
So I'm going to click add image and let's go back and add in that welcome note that I had written. So now that's going to display here. So these will be what it displays on that first page. So now let's go to our second section and we'll, this is going to be the first task or puzzle that we're going to complete. We could add a little description here of what the instructions are. And so under question, there are essentially two questions. Um, if you click on the drop down for the question type, there are lots of different question types in Google Forms, but there's really only two that work really well with escape rooms. And one is multiple choice and the other is short answer. So let's start with multiple choice. And um, it's important to make sure you turn on required for all questions in your escape room. So that way people can't just skip forward, they have to actually complete the task. And with multiple choice, you wanna click in this bottom corner here, the three vertical dots and turn on description. If you want to, you don't have to, the description's optional, but you definitely wanna turn on go to section based on answer. But sometimes if you wanna add additional description, explanation of the question. But let's, so this is our first question that we're gonna type in the box. And now down here under options, we're gonna give several different answer options. Um, so first one, let's do our correct answer. Um, and sure, this auto suggests incorrect. And then just a couple other, another wrong answer. So now here on the right side, you see where it says, continue to next section. So basically based on which answer people select, it's gonna send them to a different section. So we need to actually now go and add some sections to send people to. So this first section, let's say this was the wrong answer. So we're gonna add a try again page, um, like the one that I added in my squirrel escape room example. And here, if you want, you could go ahead and add a hint um, to help people get back to the right answer. And we're get, let's add another section. And this is a congratulations page because um, they got the right answer. So now that we've got these different sections, we can go back up here and correct answer. So we want that one to go to section four, congratulations. And we want incorrect to go to try again and wrong to go to try again. So that's the basics of setting up a multiple choice question. Um, you do the question, the different answers and direct them to where they should go. Um, so let's see. So now we're, let's add to the congratulations page. We want to add another question. So this top plus sign here on the toolbar on the right side is add a question. And let's do this one in short answer. And again, we want to turn on required. And again, we'll do the three vertical dots, turn on the description, and turn on response validation. And so again, type in, in the question field, you can type in, um, let's do <laughs> second question. And this one, short answer questions are case sensitive. So it is important um, in the description, to, you can add in a hint here and say, you know, the answers need to be in uppercase or lowercase or whichever you choose, or, you know, capitalize the first letter. And then here with these drop downs, you want to change it from number to text and then contains. And then where it says text here, we're going to actually type in our correct answer. And then under custom error text, we can add, if you want, you can add a hint here, um, like the ones that I did where, you know, it told you oh, actually, you know, this is the first line of that book. So you could go and look that up and, and figure it out. And so one nice thing about short answer questions is this is that you set that up and it won't let you proceed unless you get it right. So um, just add some good hints here to help people, but you don't have to set up the additional sections. Um, if people get it wrong, you just go ahead and add another section to continue to the next page of your escape room. 
And um, let's see here. And again, if you wanted to add to any of these sections, you can add multiple questions. We could go here and we could add another image. And so you just keep doing this over and over until you have done, completed all your tasks and puzzles and you built the whole thing and it's good to end on some kind of congratulations page. You have escaped. And on that page, um, I would generally suggest, you know, maybe putting some links back to your library and also having some kind of credit for all of the content for your escape room. You know, if you got, if you um, are using images from some other place or if your library is the owner of these images and the content, and you can type all that here in the description. So let's say now you've gone through and you've built everything um, and now you want to test it. If you go to this little eye preview icon here in the top right. So now we're going to see the participant, participant view side of the escape room. So you can go through it here and you can actually play it um, the way that any other participant would. So you can, you can test it to make sure that um, everything that you thought was going to happen would happen. You can send it to other people to test to make sure everything's right. Um, and just make sure. So here we go. So it looks like it all worked and we got to our last page. So again, this is just the bare bones basics of how to do um, the Google Forms side of the escape room. And go, if you go to the handout, it's going to have a lot more screenshots and detailed information about all of this. Um, and some of those notes like exactly what you need for a header size. So now I'm going to go back to the presentation. Okay. Um, and so just a couple of resources that I wanted to point out that I used in conjunction with Google Forms to create these. Um, first is Canva. Uh, and here I use Canva to create the custom headers because um, this is a free design website. There's also paid versions, although I think you could definitely just use the free version to do this. But you can create things in custom sizes. So I had Googled what the Google Forms header size was and found that it was this number of pixels. So I typed that in and created the header size from there. Um, I also use this to create a bunch of other graphics, um, including the, um, some of the text images because Google actually wants you to upload, um, if you wanted to have a document like the one that I had in the beginning here to start the Squirrel Escape Room, you can't add a text document in a Word or PDF format. You do need to do it as a graphic, you know, as a PNG or JPEG. So um, Canva is a great tool for that because you can do it, you can download it easily in those formats. So, um, so here are some examples of things that I did for the Harry Potter OWL exam theme one, you know, some notes from professors. I also used it to create this crossword puzzle um, and the OWL exam itself. And Another great thing that you can do um, is you can import a photo and then add some text and other graphics on top of it. So for the Squirrel Escape Room, that's what I did here. So I actually have pictures of inside the library that I added some text on top of. And I imported this squirrel sketch that one of my colleagues created. And then I was able to yeah, edit it in Canva to make it a little transparent. So it just worked better with the overall image. Another resource that I used was Certifyum, which is a Google Forms add-on. And I use this to create and send finisher certificates to all of the participants. So here are examples on the right side of the types of things that I created. So Certifyum has some default templates that you can use or you can design and import your own template. I kind of use theirs as a base and then um, you know, added in my own things from there. But one of the things that you probably noticed in my 
escape room example was I, in addition to turning on email addresses, which is what I used to send the certificates out with, I also turned on a name field, which then would populate here in these certificates. Um, and one great thing about this add-on is it automatically creates and updates an Excel file with time and date stamps for every time that one of these certificates gets mailed out. So it makes keeping stats on who completed the escape room really easy because it's already broken down by date. Um, and this also has free and paid versions. I use the free version. Um, you could upgrade if you thought you were gonna have a lot of traffic to the paid version. The free version, I believe, um, will send out up to 100 certificates a day, which um, for my library size was just fine. We've never hit the limit, uh, the daily limit, so that works. But if you were planning on having very, very high traffic, you could use the paid version. And I didn't include a tutorial um, on how to do this here or in the handout, um, but I did include a link to Certifyum and in both the presentation here, it is certifyum.com and it's in the handout. And on their website, they've got really great instructions that I followed on how to make the certificates, how to install the add-on and do and integrate everything, all of the settings that you need to turn on in Google Forms to get the add-on to work, all of those great things. And one reason that I decided to do the finisher certificates, um, in addition to just thinking that it was something cool and fun and I wanted the participants to actually like have something that they could kind of walk away from the experience with. But um, if you play around in Google Forms and if you do some other sample escape rooms, you'll see that a lot of them finish on the last page, it's the congratulations page. And it's, you know, you've already finished the escape room, you know you've done it, but then it has a sub submit button at the bottom and it's really easy to just sort of walk away from that page, just click out of it and not hit submit. And if you don't hit that last submit button, then the library of course won't actually record that you completed it and have those stats. So that was also just kind of a way for me to make sure that people finish clicking through that last screen, that last submit button, um, just so we could capture that data on our end. So Microsoft Forms, I, as you'll of course notice, I built all this in Google Forms. And from my testing and the examples that I've looked at, pretty much everyone uses Google Forms. But I did do a little bit of testing in Microsoft Forms to see if it was possible to build them there in case that's what your organization uses instead of Google. And what I found is that, yes, it has the same functionality, just different labeling and format, but you could pretty easily go through um, and do the same types of things with multiple choice and short answer questions. So I think it you know, really just come down to personal preference, which one you'd wanna work with um, and just which one you thought was better aesthetically. Personally, I think Google is, but up to you. Uh, but one major thing that was a downside for me is that there was no option to integrate the certificate add-on, which I really wanted to do. So some ideas and inspiration for your future virtual escape rooms. One thing um, that I, when I started, thought was important was I wanted to tie things into other programs that we were doing. And I think in general, that's a great idea and you can get a lot of inspiration there. And on the right hand side, you can see here that one of the other programs that our library launched during the pandemic was Goodnight Flagstaff, which one of my coworkers organized and it's a community reading of different books. Um, different staff and community members would volunteer to read a chapter and record it, and we would broadcast it on our YouTube channel. And uh, we started this at the beginning of the pandemic with the Harry Potter series. And so I was doing a couple other virtual things like trivia that I created to go along with each book, but for book five, which is when Harry and company take their OWL exams, that was when I launched the OWL exam escape room to tie in with the book. So I thought that was a nice tie in and I'm sure each of you with your libraries, you've got plenty of other examples of how you could do that. Um, I also think the summer reading challenge is, provides a lot of opportunity. You could, you could use the theme to come up with an escape room. Um, something that I did with the 
through the library squirrels escape room was I launched that during the summer reading challenge. It wasn't necessarily the exact theme, although last year's theme was imagine your story. So going through all the different genres did sort of fit in. But the main thing that I did was I created a summer reading challenge mission. So that way um, you could, if you went and completed the escape room, you could get points for completing the mission by uploading your finisher certificate. So that was another great integration of the certificates into the summer reading challenge. And I think it, some other great ideas would be escape rooms to get to know your library building, your resources, online databases, things like that, kind of endless possibilities there. Um, it's just lots of fun, especially when I did the library squirrel escape room one, I was thinking, you know, people can't come in the library. So this is a great opportunity to do something virtual where people could actually, you know, get a sneak peek inside the library and also get to know our catalog and some other things at the same time. But I think there are a lot of opportunities to do things like exploring your databases and other online resources as well. And I am not a teacher librarian, but I have seen other examples where teacher librarians used virtual escape rooms as sort of an end of year review. So that way, um, you know, just a fun way to kind of review before a test at the end of the year, or just, you know, see what your students have been learning. And so that's another great idea if you're in that field. So converting in-person escape rooms to online, this is something that um, when I, <laughs> there's so many things I wish I had known ahead of time. And so I just wanted to share some of my learning experiences and thoughts on this. So of course, in 2019, the escape rooms that we held at my library, we had really <laughs> no idea that we would ever be trying to do, whether we'd be closed or trying to do a virtual escape room. Um, and so, of course, we created all of these great things and we took lots of photos of the escape room. But then when I actually went to build it online, I realized that we really didn't have all of, I just didn't have the types of photos that I needed. So things that I would suggest um, moving forward, I definitely, if I do another in-person escape room, would, would do all of this and convert it to online. As I mentioned before, I think it's a great way to reach more people and get more mileage out of the program. But I would take more photos, um, more overall setting shots. This one um, here on the right side is a horrible example of that. This is one of the only photos I could find of the great hall that we built for our in-person escape room where the OWL exams were. You can kind of see we've got the house banners. We have some faux stained glass windows that we painted, but this picture has got terrible lighting. We've just got stuff piled all over the place. So I, of course I wouldn't actually want to use this in the online escape room. We also didn't take very many detail shots and you need a lot of up close shots of the clues to be able to figure it out online. And so now, and I ended up having to recreate all of that. I couldn't use any of the photos that we took. So I had to you know, dig everything back out, set it back up and take those detail shots. We also took a lot of shots with people because that's really fun. But then again, they just didn't really work with the overall setting um, or the detail that we needed. So I would, for the future, I would take more shots without people as the focus. I would also go back and take some short videos. Videos are things that you can integrate into Google Forms and it would have been really fun to have when the escape room, which went through our whole library, it was really beautiful. And it was set up to have like a little video of each space so that way as you progressed to different sections, you could just kind of set the scene by clicking on the video and looking around at the scenery. And as I mentioned before, you can't upload a Word or PDF document into Google Forms to display. It needs to be in a JPEG or other image format. And so I had to go back and um, either convert or recreate a lot of the things that we had created for the in-person escape rooms. And moving forward, now I know, okay, you just need to create it um, in that format to begin with or create it somewhere like Canva where you can have the option of downloading it in different formats. And then one thing that was 
really tough was, of course, we designed all of our escape rooms to be for groups. So, and, you know, in person, where it's a little easier to see and play with the clues. And so converting it to online really needed to make it a lot easier. Um, so some of the ways that I did that was instead of whereas in the in-person escape room, it was more open-ended and the virtual one did more fill in the blanks so people could actually see, you know, how many characters they needed to enter or make things multiple choice. So that way there was a limited number of things that you could choose from. And I added a lot more hints than we would have given out in person. And I still worry that that one is too tough, but it was designed for adults. But I still, when I, after the OWL escape room, I made the library one, library scrolls one a lot easier. So some other additional resources, as I mentioned, uh, the, I created a handout, which Patty has put in the chat and will also be sent out as part of your um, follow-up email. And the, in the handout and also here are some links to some other examples. And you can, um, the links to the two that I created, the Free the Library Scrolls Escape Room and OWL Escape Room. And um, Madison County Public Library did a great roundup of a bunch of different escape rooms. And if you click on it, there's across all kinds of age groups, themes, genres, lots of different examples. So that's a great place to start if you just want to see kind of the possibilities of what's out there, look at what different people have done, their different styles, um, you know, different levels of basically just using Google Forms or adding in a lot of extra add-ons to make it much fancier. So those are all great places to get started. Um, and then finally, I'm just gonna throw out my contact information if anyone wants to follow up with me or ask any more questions. So, and this is a picture of me on the right with one of my former colleagues. And we are painting the, this is of course pre-COVID, so don't worry why we're not wearing masks, painting the faux stained glass in our library as the great hall for our, one of the escape rooms that we built. And so here is my email address and also our library's general programming email address where you can reach our entire programming team. And these are also on the handout. And I just, and thank you to Elise and Patty for your assistance with this presentation. And also to just AZLA Professional Development Committee in general for the opportunity to present today. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we've enjoy, enjoyed learning so much about how to build a virtual escape room. We have about six questions, and so I'll get started. Our first question is coming from Sarah. And so she's asking, what is the best way to ensure the escape room users hit the submit button at the end of their session instead of just closing the page out? Uh, she's uh, and the second question really talks about statistics as, as well. And so she's uh, again asking at the end of the session, instead of just closing the last page, so it will tally the results of the statistics or what is the best way to tabulate participation. Right. So the answer to the first one to get people to click that submit. That's why I incorporated that certify them add on with the certificate because just an extra incentive that, to hit that submit button. So for me, that was how I got around that problem. Um, and I think it, it seems to be working. And then there are two ways to actually track statistics. Google will track them for you. So um, it, on the back end of, let me, I can escape out of this and show you. Um, so here, this is the one we just built. Um, if anyone, let's see, we can go ahead and hit submit here. So now I've completed the escape room and now you can go in and you can see on the back end responses, I have one person who completed the escape room. So you can see that here under responses in Google. But then if you also have set up the certify them add-on 
that does create an Excel spreadsheet that tracks every single person who finished and um, their name, email address, and the, has the time and date stamp of when it was sent out. So that I found to be really useful because um, yeah. it has more information than Google tracks. So in order to track, you know, over time, how many people have done each of these escape rooms, you know, each month for just statistics that I, I found that doing the certify and add-on was easier for that. Okay. Um, the other question, I think I'm sort of losing it. It's scrolled up. It also dealt with statistics as well. How many people participated in a virtual um, escape room overall? Um, so it's still, they're still going up. Um, I would say when I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, um, but they're still live online. We get a few more. I did make them as missions, both escape rooms as part of our missions for some reading challenge again this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen just in the last um, couple weeks, I would say maybe we've had like 10 people take them since the summer reading challenge started, something like that. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, um, but they were more popular last year when I put them up for the first time. Um, and I think one thing that could increase statistics is I wish we had a, <laughs> had a, I don't have right now, we're working on doing some new things with our website, but I don't have a permanent home on our website to link them from. So they get linked through our social media and we see a little spike every time that they get linked there. The so last count, what did you have? I don't have those numbers in front of me, but like I said, I, I would say during some reading challenge, I think between the two of them, they've been taken at least 10 times in the last couple of weeks. So um, the, there is a question. So the questions are going up. So we've gone past six at this point, but um, can you put a link into um, to your escape room in the chat? I believe Patty just did that. Okay. So I think they're both um, in here. And Let's see. The other one, are you planning any, how, so you said you have two escape rooms right now, correct? Yes. So are you planning any new escape rooms? One that I would like to do that I haven't started yet is we just launched early a few months ago this year, a new catalog with our library. And I would love to do something Kind of exploring the catalog. It's got some great features like placards, where if you put in certain search terms, it'll give you a placard back um, that, you know, that where I could do things like put hints or hide clues. So I think that could be a really fun one that I would like to do in the future, kind of explo exploring this new resource, showing people how to use it, and then being able to hide things in there. Okay, so I'm an academic librarian. Could I use the same Google Form uh, technology for other virtual library programming? Yes, I think you could use it for a lot of things. Other things that I've used it for was to create trivia quizzes, and you can really use it to create any kind of test or quiz, um, and so it doesn't have to be an escape room format. So I think as you know, you could you could do it with any you know, any book or program that you wanted to have trivia associated with, you could create something there. And uh, maybe not where you work, Elise, but if you were a school librarian, like I mentioned, those sort of end of year reviews, you could do that either as just a basic quiz or you could do it more in the escape room format. But, but the Google Forms itself um, has all kinds of different things you can do. You can also turn on, I'm going back to settings, but under quizzes, you can make this a quiz and assign point values. So someone working in an academic setting, um, you know, you may want to use it for that. And then it would give, it could also give, um, send people back information about their missed questions and correct answers and things like that. But I want to do something fun like you. I don't want to do it. <laughs> and you, and I, and I you don't definitely- want to be that person. <laughs> And you could, I think, you know, either all of these, you can make them easier or harder based on the age level that you're working with. Okay. Do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with us or anything like that? Just that it's, 
Um, very, very easy to use. I don't think you need to have a lot of technical skill level to do this. You definitely don't need to have a lot of graphic or design skill level. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to jump into it mm -hmm. um, and play around and, and figure out new things. And you'll probably discover lots of things that I didn't discover and new ways to do it. Well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, as well as uh, Amer uh, Ari I want to keep saying America, but uh, the Arizona Library Association and the Arizona State Library for sponsoring today's webinar. Don't forget to complete our brief survey posted in the chat. You will receive an email with a link of the recording of this webinar and a participation survey. Have a wonderful day. And again, thank you, Lauren, for providing the webinar for us today. Thank you, Elise. And thank you to the rest of the Professional Development Committee.